Brooks. As Dr. Wayne said, I'm an undergraduate working in the local performance lab. Dr. Wayne's favorite undergrad, I think I'm legally allowed to say that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> it's a toss up. <laughs> we'll arm our support later. But, uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about ground, uh, ground force application during a sprint start, uh, whether or not it's typically optimal or maximal. So, to give you guys a little bit of background. Okay, Justin. I know. I, you really got it. I can't try. Ground reaction force. Basically, for those of you taking physics or biomechanics, ground reaction force is the force exerted from the ground on a body in contact with it. And this is uh, the ground reaction force for each football in a 40 meter sprint. And basically, the short story here is that through different phases of the sprint, the ground reaction force profiles look different. So. Uh, and during the top speed portion, which is at the, the end over here, the more and more vertical force you apply, the faster you can move. Uh, horizontal braking and propulsive forces are equal because it's really about maintaining the body's momentum. During the acceleration phase, propulsive forces and horizontal axis are greater than braking forces and vertical is getting progressively larger and larger. But what we're gonna look at in the context of this talk here is what we term as step zero, which is the initial push off in the sprint. And uh, basically the effect of ground force application on this region right here, which is time spent in the air, as you can see there's no force data put on that. Uh, also, this funny looking shape here, if you average all that force data, it, it, it should ideally come out to about one body weight because I'm standing here and I'm applying a body weight's worth of force into the ground and any, anything greater would put me into the air. So let's talk about the limiters of ground reaction force production during step zero. First of which being friction. And basically the main takeaway here is that if the horizontal force production exceeds the friction force, the athlete is gonna slip. But if we implement some sort of mechanical interface here, like track locks or cleats on turf, then the coefficient, of, the coefficient of friction is going to be one or greater, and therefore the horizontal force production is not going to be limited, and so uh, therefore not the strain. Next, we want to look at balance, and that's uh, basically the angle at which the center of mass is traveling. And if it's too low, the athlete's not going to have enough time or space to get their leg around for step one. And uh, that's basically the story there, that's the main takeaway, is that if, the, if you're producing too much horizontal force without enough vertical to allow your, uh, your secondary limb to come around, then you're gonna fall flat on your face. Uh, center mass trajectory, this is kind of the flip side of, of the force production, whereas if you're producing more vertical than you are uh, horizontally, then you're gonna spend too much time in the air, whereas the guys next to you may be controlling the vertical force production in such a way that they're into their next steps while you're still in the air. This happens in a fraction of a second. So it brings to our question, are ground forces maximized when accelerating from a stationary start? We predict that an individual will produce ground reaction force actually sub-maximally during step zero as a result of the intervention mechanical limiters. So previous testing that has uh, looked at force production during the sprint uh, is this tethered self-propelled treadmill method where the athlete, you can see here, that he's basically tied to the wall. And we're questioning the validity of this method because it allows the athlete to get into an abnormally unnatural uh, low angle to initiate their sprint, and therefore they're producing these massive amounts of horizontal force, which is not really indicative of what actually happens in real life, because how many times are you doing a sprint while <laughs> attached to a wall? Uh, a little bit better is the Kistler and Vertec instrumented force blocks. Essentially, the, there, there's load cells fitted into these blocks, and so you're able to measure force while the athlete is initiating a sprint using their own proprioceptive means, so he's not attached to a wall, he's actually doing a sprint start. So to look at our methods, <clears throat> similar to the Kistler and Vertex system is we use track block, it's our mechanical interface that allows us to not constrain our amount of force on force production. But the difference here is that our track blocks are just standard track blocks attached to force plates. 
And the main benefit that we see here is if you look closely, each of these athletes is in contact with the ground with their toes. And if you're in a four-point stance, you're going to be um, in contact with the ground with your hands as well. The Kistler and Vertex force block are not able to account for the vertical force that comes from being in contact with the ground with the toes and the hands. And so therefore, when you get these, these data outputs, it gives them these, again, unnaturally low resultant angles that are not necessarily indicative of what's actually happening. And so it's important that we're able to account for all of that vertical force so we can see what is truly going on. So our methods, we, uh, we recruited five male subjects with mixed experience using the blocks. <clears throat> we uh, conducted four tests and two trials each. And uh, you're gonna see all of those here in just a minute. Uh, Three-dimensional force data was collected at 1,000 hertz, and video imaging was collected at 240 hertz, slow motion. So our first test is a normal track start, sprint from point A to point B as fast as possibly can. Uh, we recruited the top amateur sprinter in the DW area. <laughs> um, this video. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how many more jerks I have left in this talk. Uh, we just find out good. The uh, next test is the mat dive, and uh, essentially the same as the normal track star, except you dive out maximally onto a mat as low as you possibly can, the lowest possible trajectory. And uh, yeah, we weren't very clever with coming up with the names for these tests, but. Lo and behold, that's our mat dive. <laughs> now, after you know, discussing, we collected that first round of pilot data, and after discussing uh, some differences that we've noticed with the way athletes will orient their blocks, you see the difference in spacing between the blocks here. We thought, is there some sort of advantage uh, for having the blocks spaced further apart or close together? And so we proposed that we would also include variations of those two tests in which the blocks were right next to each other without, without that kind of staggered stance that you typically see in track and field. And uh, yeah, you can't really tell, I, can't, I don't think, but those blocks are right next to each other. So it's almost like he's, yeah, he's just doing normal sprint with the, without a staggered stance. My favorite part of this video actually is uh, Dr. Ryan's enthusiasm. <laughs> but, uh, so our next test is the, the, the mat dive with the, with the blocks in line. Um, essentially, he's doing a vertical jump sideways, not a broad jump, but an actual sideways vertical jump is what I like to call it. And we wanted to uh, basically see what the force profiles look like during this few tests. So we use we utilize three main equations to get our data outputs. We want to find the magnitude of the ground reaction force. So basically, um, if you guys are familiar with Pythagorean's theorem, we get the, sum, the square root of the sum of the vertical um, force squared plus the horizontal force squared, and we get our GRF magnitude. We want the resultant angle, which is so we take the arch tan, arch tan of the vertical force over the horizontal force, and that gives us our resultant angle. And then this fun little uh, time spent in the air equation, I can, I can walk you guys through that. Basically, the vertical or the uh, velocity of the center mass in the air, the vertical velocity of the center mass in the air is equal to the vertical velocity of the center mass uh, through the contact portion of the sprint of step zero. And when you break that down to acceleration and time, you're subject to acceleration due to gravity times the time you're in the air is equal to the acceleration of center mass during the propulsive phase times the time uh, during the propulsive phase. Break it down a little further, and F over M is acceleration, because those of you who took biomechanics, minus the gravitational component times T con that. And then we get this formula equation that uh, gives us the amount of time of the center mass spent in the air during this test. <clears throat> so our results. This uh, graphic, just get, so you guys can get your bearings here, on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, we have the horizontal component expressed in body weights. And so basically mass specific forces, how much force you're applying to the ground with respect to your body weight. Uh, vertical force is on the y axis here, again expressed in body weights. And we can now see the resultant magnitude and angle from each of these four tests. The green here is our normal sprint start. The um, the red is our uh, traditional mat dive where we're in the staggered stance and we do the mat dive. The gold here is the inline normal start where the blocks are inline and you try to do a sprint start. 
and then the blue is our inline mat dive. And so we see quite a quite a bit of variation between the magnitudes and angles between these four tests. And the fascinating thing here is if you look at, so the question we were looking to answer is, is force maximized uh, when accelerating from a stationary start with, during normal track condition. But for some reason, whenever you look at the blocks being in line, which no one does, we are able to produce slightly more force at a lower angle. And you will see the effect that, that has on uh, the time spent in the air. But then this crooked number right here with the inline mat dive, a 182 total body um, total force with respect to your body weight uh, is insane at a 48 degree angle. And this is the averages for all subjects, all tests, all trials. So this is the in the blue here. We have, okay, so we have normal start mat dive, inline normal start, and an inline mat dive. The green portion of the bar graph is the time that's spent on the ground through the propulsive phase. And then the blue is the time spent in the air as a result of the force that you produce. And with the normal start, we, uh, so this is expressed obviously in milliseconds. The lowest amount of, the smallest amount of time was spent in the, in the blocks during the inline normal starts. And the amount of force that you produce vertically um, has, a, has a pretty significant effect on the time you spend in the air. So if you look at the inline mat dive where we saw the massive uh, GRF magnitude and the low angle, even though you got into a low angle, you produced a proportionate amount of vertical force with respect to the amount of horizontal force that you exerted, and you spent a lot of time in the air, which as I mentioned earlier, is bad for performance. So just to kind of give you guys a quick little visual of what's going on here, this was the video of the inline mat dive. And in this portion right here, he's just supporting his body weight. So he, he ends up getting a peak horizontal force that's more than two times his body weight. But with this particular test, these shapes look a little different. But if you average them out, he produced, he produced an equal amount of vertical force as he did horizontal force. And still got like a perfect 45 degree angle on this test. So conclusions. Basically, what we're finding so far is that horizontal force can be increased beyond the normal track condition, and that increases in horizontal force are actually accompanied by proportionate increases in horizontal and in, in vertical force, so you don't fall flat on your face, like I mentioned earlier. And uh, that ends up resulting in a greater time spent in the air, which is uh, adverse to performance. And so therefore, we believe that force is likely optimized rather than maximized during normal track conditions. So our future testing, is that we would like to continue with those four tests with the same uh, three-dimensional force data, 1,000 hertz, slow motion video, imaging. We also want to include kinematic data so we can get a little bit of a deeper dive into what's happening with joint angles and where the GRF angle is, uh, where the GRF is, is traveling to the center of mass or not. And then we want to ideally get up to 10 experienced block users to participate in this. So uh, I will now address any questions. Thank <laughs> you.